Hello and welcome to another episode of Back to Britpop, it's me Chris. On this episode I'm delighted to be joined by Douglas T. Stewart of BMX Bandits. BMX Bandits formed in the late 80s and have been making music steadily ever since. Uh, Their output has been phenomenal and uh, Douglas is a fantastic guest. Uh, We talk about everything and anything uh, in this interview it's a really good chat as always i'll be back at the end to talk about how you can support the podcast but let's get on to the interview because it's a cracker here's douglas welcome to the podcast douglas t stewart how are you yeah i'm pretty good thank you i'm all the better for to be speaking to you of course i would say i'm doing pretty well and i was actually doing some recording today so that was a nice thing some Uh recording with another human being <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah this it's getting to the point now where just the, these little luxuries are starting to come back into our lives it is it's kind of um it can't be beat you know um i mean obviously there's some people it may be an advantage for to some <laughs> when you think about some people well that's mm. good for at a distance here but yeah our most people i i know um it's very good when i can see them in person rather than them being at a distance yeah and it kind of goes against the whole ethos of the bmx bandits and you are like a super group of of uh, musicians and and people it's all about you know being to get the togetherness of, of the music and so this is yeah obviously hit you guys well, quite hard i think i think of us i guess as being a sort of extended family more than a traditional group mm. so yeah i guess for us it's um it definitely, well, I'm sure actually for most groups. I mean, I think when groups are younger, they go through this period of almost intensely being just around each other 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then you get to a certain age where people start having families and doing other things where that isn't the case any much, mm. anymore. But there's still um, a sort of longing when, when you are apart. I mean, I'm sure some groups, but it's, it's ex- the exact opposite of a longing, you know. But um, <laughs> in our case, uh, why only today I was just thinking about, oh, it'd be so good to see Norman in person because uh, Norman Blake, he's obviously been a long-term part of the BMX Bandits family. He left officially in 1991 to concentrate mainly on Teenage Fan Club. But he's been on most of the records we've made since then and still pops up playing live every so often. So it feels strange. I've not seen Norman for quite a while. Have you got a plan for the, you know, the, the, the grand opening up of everything? Have you got some sort of idea in terms of either some sort of a gig or a reunion gig or, or even just, a, you know, some sort of social event? I think there will be some recording that involves just more than two people. Yeah. Um, I also think, yeah, it looks like there's going to be well, there's a gig in October in Newcastle with Shown and Knife, a kind of stripped down version of BMX Bandits uh, with Shown and Knife. I can't remember the exact date, but it's a bit unprofessional of me, but it's out there on the internet. Um, but yeah, I think there will be hopefully a couple of other gigs before then. I can't actually announce dates yet. Not because I can't remember them this time, because they've not been finalised. Yeah, this is the thing. A lot of it up in the air and and obviously down to venues being able to facilitate people safely. And and that's the big question on everybody's lips at the moment is what's going to happen and when's it going to happen. But we're getting there. That's the main thing. We are. We're getting there. That used to be a train company logo, I think. <laughs> yes. I think Br- British Rail used to say we're getting there. It wasn't, it wasn't that encouraging. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Douglas, I often ask on the podcast, uh, my guests, just to talk a little bit about their their sort of uh, formative years with music. And um, I'm really interested to know kind of what kind of dynamic was at home with you in, uh, in terms of you know, buying records or just listening to music on the radio in the kitchen and or, or, or kind of what were your early experiences with with music um well neither of my parents were musical um but my sister she was pretty good at picking up instruments and playing them you know and she oh she was a good accordion player and I went to guitar lessons for five years and after about six months my sister didn't have any guitar lessons she could play better than me you know (laughs) and she could play better than I could ever play but 
I guess the thing I had was I always heard tunes in my head. And so um, even at primary school, I was sort of making up little songs, which I would uh, be encouraged to go around the, the classes and do a little show for all the classes. I went to a really kind of regular school in a place called Belsall, which was a kind of ex-steel and ex-mining town. Uh, so it's kind of working class, but a kind of, I guess, decaying working class at that time. Mm. And um, so it wasn't like some sort of theatre school <laughs> where people were expected to be performers. You were a bit of a kind of outsider if you had these kind of... Um, notions in your head but Norman Blake funnily enough we were talking about his first memory because he was at the same school a year below me was uh, one Friday afternoon his teacher going and Douglas Stewart's um, going to be entertaining us this afternoon <laughs> and yeah so I would I would go in and I would do an act you know I'd do a few impersonations like Columbo, Frank Spencer, uh, Dennis Healy and then um, I would uh, do a, a song that I'd made up uh, usually unaccompanied, and then do some jokes or some other material. And uh, I kind of sort of became almost like a celebrity at my primary school by doing this. Yeah. It was kind of, you know, most most uh, playtimes, uh, certainly afternoon playtimes, I'd be on the school wall doing a, <laughs> doing a little <laughs> show. And it was interesting because I wasn't, I was quite a shy or quite, maybe not shy, but quite introverted um, sort of a child. I didn't really go out much and play like football or play on, play on bikes and stuff like that way. Uh, other kids of my age, I tended to prefer to stay home and watch like films and TV shows with my mum mm. and get, kind of get lost in that, that world. And music was a big part of that for me. Things like the music from... Uh, Robinson Crusoe, The Adventures of Robinson Crusoe, uh, the theme from The Persuaders, theme from White Horses, Flash and Blade, and lots of other things too. The, the, the music and the music from a lot of films really, really um, resonated with me and yeah. made a big impression on me. I mean, I liked some pop bands, you know, I liked David Bowie, I liked Mud, I liked uh, T Rex, but I liked these. Uh, sounds I was hearing accompanying, you know, films and TV shows that I was interested in. And I never even really loved the TV show The Persuaders that much, but I would watch it because I wanted to experience the music. Yeah. At those days, there, there was so so much emphasis on, like, those uh, theme tune creators that were almost um, pop stars and rock stars in their own right, weren't they? Because they were, you know, household names, and they 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 yeah. they wrote so many classic and uh, timeless theme tunes. I know, and that, it's funny. So many people that are roughly my age. I remember quite well going about twenty years ago, talking to Jarvis Cocker um, about how much the Robinson Crusoe TV series his soundtrack meant, mm. you know, to both of us. And uh, he'd had a Channel 4 documentary about outsider art, and he used a theme uh, from the Robinson Crusoe programme, which wasn't the main theme. It was a sort of moody variation of it, but almost sounded like a cross between John Barry and um, Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys, mm. a theme called Cannibals. And, you know, and I think it's that sort of thing. Um, a lot of people who have these memories uh, of that kind of music, it was a strange memory where the music was sort of sad. It wasn't like happy music. It made you want to jump about and, you know, have a real good time, like uh, I guess a lot of kind of chart music. It kind of made you feel sad, but you liked the feeling. Yeah. It was yes. like a beautiful sadness. Even as a child, you were somehow drawn to it. And it's weird that you say that because I have all those those memories of sitting down with my grandparents and watching you know, daytime TV soaps like Sons and Daughters and mm -hmm. uh, the, the Sullivans and even things like Dallas and Dynasty, where the, the theme tunes were kind of that, that yeah, sort of melancholy. Yeah, they, paid, they, they used to pay proper attention to a lot of um, TV music. I feel maybe not quite as much now. Mm. I mean, there's still lots of great music getting written for the cinema, but there's a lot of movies now. It almost feels like it's a collection of just almost like product placed records 
Yeah, yeah. You know, well, there, uh, rather than having somebody create this amazing score. There, there's one um, theme tune, which is Juliet Bravo, which every time I hear it, if it's ever on these kind of mm-hmm. clip shows, takes me back. It, it just brings back a... I mean, the program was such a grey, <laughs> a grey program, and the theme tune was so almost oppressive. I know I, I, this is the only one that takes me back and why it's not a comforting memory. It's more of a, a, a just a, you know, a stormy window scene and, and, and rain and greyness, and it's just awful. <laughs> it's like a time machine. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, Julia Bravo, you know, as you say, it was a sort of, I don't know, it was in a sort of cusp. There used to be kind of TV dramas about cops like Dixon Dot Green, where George Dixon, the long-serving uh, PC was everybody's friend and then it, I think he became Sergeant Dixon but he was this kind of jovial friendly nice policeman and um, you know the cases tended to be the police were always on the side of integrity and goodness and decency and then it got a little bit grey Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, Juliet Bravo, it wasn't, you know, it was no line of duty, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, um, which might be a good thing, I don't know. Uh, but it, it was certainly going to slightly darker areas, not yeah. really dark areas, but it wasn't, you know, it didn't necessarily leave you smiling at the end of the episode and you would go, ah, I feel safe knowing <laughs> PC Dixon or Sergeant Dixon's out there looking looking after us. Um yeah, it's a, it's a it's classic, and it's, it's it is a, a testament, isn't it, how these kind of shows um, evolve into into what we know now. So you can't sit and watch a a jovial police dr- procedural drama now. We have to have grit and you oh, know, yeah. Luther. Oh know. God, <laughs> you Why have to gear yourself up to it. <laughs> Sometimes the, the level of grit is so earnest. You yeah. Know, for instance, you know. Uh, I remember like watching some of the reboot of Doctor Who when my son was younger. So from kind of Christopher Eccleston onwards. Yeah. And if you want to say, I really enjoyed a lot of it, but sometimes it got so earnest. And I'd be like, this isn't, you're, you're not like Martin Luther King making some, you know, incredibly important historic speech here. You're a Time Lord and a kind of fun <laughs> fantasy show. Yeah. keep it light <laughs> yeah oh yeah i know what you mean with these um... i just remembered actually uh, sorry yeah. to jump about but That's Dixon right. Doug green had a great poignant sort of poignant theme very pleasant theme which the actor jack warner wrote the main ah. star of Dixon and Doug green i would recommend looking back and listening to it yeah. Is it slightly better than my version? <laughs> Just slightly. <laughs> if you do it justice. I was going to ask you, um, when you started to sort of you know, write these little songs and things and, and you were sort of on your road to becoming mm-hmm. a songwriter, I guess, were you, were, you, were you encouraged by your parents? What did they think of all this? I think I was encouraged. I mean, I remember when I um, eventually I said, well, I want what I want to do with my life is I want to write songs and um, and probably I'll be the person performing them as well. And I mean, funnily enough, my mum talks about this and uh, there's a documentary film about BMX band. It's called Serious Drugs, a guy, a guy called Jim Burnsmead, which is really lovely. And my late mum's in it, which is really nice to see her. And she's kind of saying, oh, and his dad used to go, but Douglas, you can't play any instruments. <laughs> How are you going to do that? You know, it's like sort of a bit like saying, well, I want you to be a long distance truck driver. You don't have a driving license. <laughs> you, know? you know, and then my mum went on to say, oh, and he proved, he proved his dad wrong. <laughs> uh, and it's funny, I think I remember coming across an article when I was quite young about Lionel Bart, who wrote, I guess, quite a lot of hits for people like Tommy Steele and Cliff Richard, but went on to write Oliver and other stuff. He wrote really great songs. And then I read, Lionel Bart didn't play any instruments and he couldn't read or write music. And I was Mm. like, see, it can be done. You don't need to just be the lyricist. The thing you need to be able to do is hear melodies in your head 
And very often I, when I hear a melody, I also, it's a bit like I live in a musical, you know, when somebody's in a musical and they start singing and there's an orchestra playing behind them or a band. And you go, oh, wait a minute, he's, he's in the middle of nowhere. Where's all this music coming from? Well, sort of when I start singing a new song in my head, I sort of hear the band. I imagine it, mm. you know, um, can I, so no one else can hear it. So then I'll, you know, be sitting with like, uh, you know, someone like Norman in the past, David Scott or Francis, uh, or more recently, it's people like Stuart Kidd and now uh, Andrew Patty, who I was working with today. And I'll be saying, and I hear this bit going like this. And then there maybe there's a kind of trumpet sound that does this. So I hear a lot of that. But of yeah. course, when you collaborate with really great people, as I've been fortunate, they go, well, instead of the trumpet doing that, what about we have it doing this? And you go, oh, that's even better. And that's where it becomes a, a collaboration, you know, because, um, you know, they, they bring their own musicality to trying to bring my ideas to life, I guess. Did you ever have any conflicts of interest in that way? Because you obviously you're living in living in in this musical world where in your head it sounds specifically like something. Were you ever did you ever have any times where you had to put your foot down though, Douglas? Yeah, sometimes sometimes I've got something really, really in my head that I want to stick to. Mm. And but as I say, I, I'm not I don't even know when I'm that stubborn because as I say, on the albums I worked on with David Scott, I remember quite a lot of times I sort of imagined a, a, a line that would only go so far, like a melody line that would only go so far on a certain instrument. And then David would go, and after it does that, it could continue doing this. Yeah, and yeah. I'd go, yes, hallelujah, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> So generally, I think I've been very fortunate. What tends to happen is, particularly now, partly maybe just because I've been doing it for a long while, so a lot of people are more willing to trust me with it. But I think now when I tend to work with other people, it feels like they want to do their very, very best at trying to make it as close to or better than I'd kind of had it in my head. In terms of the lyrics, though, uh, Douglas, I wanted to just ask you whether at any point, you know, your lyrical style veered off in a different direction, because one, one of the things I always noticed, obviously, was the the optimism of, of your lyrics, and they are all essentially love songs or or have the, a romantic feel to them, as far as I'm concerned. And mm -hmm. And did you ever have... Or did you ever try and veer off into any other kind of writing? Well, funnily enough, I guess one of the examples, uh, we released a single, a digital-only single last year, which I wrote with Anton Newcomb of the Brian Jonestown Massacre. And then Sean Dixon, who I started William X Bandits with, um, had sort of reworked it. And so we released a single called Razor Blades and Honey. Yes, and yeah. And... We, when I was staying with Anton in Berlin, Chloe and I were staying here for a few days. Um, he's a amazing studio set up um, with an engineering call 24 hours a day. <laughs> and I can't remember what time it was. I don't think it was too uncivilised, but Anton was like, let's, let's write something together. And he came up with a chord project, pro uh, chord progression, that's the one. And um, I came up with a melody and a lyric. And Anton's really very politically aware. And I don't think I'd ever written any kind of political song. And I definitely didn't want to write a song that had some sort of ill-informed... I mean, I'm a, I'm a guy in the band. I don't know any more or have any more of the definite answers than someone who happens to be a plumber or a waiter or whatever, you know. Mm. Um, so I wanted to have something that had a more kind of general kind of political message about, I guess, the kind of breed of politician that now feels it's they're not always driven even by things that they believe in. You know, they're more um, 
driven by their own personal ambition and greed and their own ego. Because yeah. I think there's lots of politicians in the past that I definitely had no sympathy towards their beliefs. But very often you would go, I do get the feeling that they believe this. And that could, you know, obviously people could believe in things that were terrible. But I find it slightly more sinister, this kind of breed of self-serving politicians who you go, we now know this person doesn't even believe this, mm. but for champion this just for their own their own benefit. And um so that was uh, the kind of, I guess, the psychogenesis behind um, Razor Blades and Honey. But I didn't even mention it was about politics. That was mm. the initial influence. But I just sort of thought, what? this could apply to almost any walk of life. The person who always has butterfly eyes while you are talking to you, looking for someone better to talk to in the room. When I say someone better, someone who is able uh, to facilitate their kind of journey up the ladder rather than, oh, why would I Why would I talk to this person? Because they're a nice, interesting person. Nice, interesting people aren't good <laughs> enough for me. Yeah, I want yeah. someone who can open doors for me. So, yeah, it's not confined uh, just to politics. But, yeah, I, I sort of was inspired to do that because I just thought, well, that'll be, it'll be an interesting thing to try to do something else and on the album Down at the Hawk, funnily enough, there's a few songs that weren't really from me. I kinda I I think I can't remember who it was, but I was reading um a songwriter writing about how he, you know, imagining himself as different characters in different situations. And I thought, well for SLP I think I'm going to try and do that a little bit and write songs um based on characters who might actually see love and different things a bit differently than I see it. Yeah, yeah. But then what sometimes happens is people go, I can't believe what you now think is this. You go, <laughs> I don't. It's a bit like, you know, when someone writes a book or a film, they don't necessarily agree with everything that the lead character's saying here, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so do you think without yeah. with, with those exceptions then, do you think with the most of the yeah. content of your songs be kind of autobiographical then? Mostly, yeah. I sort of, I mean, I say this and it sort of sounds a little bit like a joke, but I sort of mean it. I, I guess a lot of it's like Douglas the musical. You know, it's like a heightened version of my reality. It sort of makes sense that the people playing on the records are very often almost like supporting characters in the stories because it's, um, it's sort of about my life and encounters and stuff like that and hopes and dreams <laughs> and, and heartaches but the people who would be very often my confidants or you know my friend who helped me through the thing or my friend who had a wonderful time with me in this adventure there's a good chance these people will actually be playing <laughs> on the tracks as well you know or well Chloe's my partner and she's also in the band as well so it's uh it's an interesting thing and I remember when Eugene, Eugene Kelly was in the band for quite a while and really good friends with Eugene. And we were doing this kind of songwriter circle thing. It was myself, David Scott and Eugene. And I think he wasn't in the band anymore at this time. And he sort of said to me, all of your, and I don't think he was meaning that kind of critical. He was going, he's going, all of your songs are love songs. Do you never want to write about other stuff? And I really thought about it. And then I was kind of going, I sort of think it's a not. I think it's such a big topic. I mm. think if you're just writing it in a kind of cliched way and it's not real, yeah, it can get a bit tired. But it's probably the thing that still inspires me, you know, and it's not just yeah. inspires me lyrically. It's what inspires me musically. You know, I'll see, you know, uh, someone I'm in love with moving in a certain way or I'll think back to, you know, something that happened between us and I'll start hearing a tune which is like the soundtrack to the movie version, my mind movie version of, you know, uh, that tearful situation or that wonderful walk along the beach or whatever. You know? Well, I, so, I think I think that's, uh, you've hit the nail on the head there for me in terms of, you know, your your songs about, you know, they are about 
love in many ways, but they they transpire that in, in in so many ways as well. And I think from a from a songwriter's perspective, the way you describe mundane situations in relationships and 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 being in love and you know, seeing certain things happen in certain ways, I think is what we would all try to aspire to to try and elevate the you know the the, the points that they're trying to get across about how they're feeling. I well, think that's what that's... sets you apart. Yeah, that's a lovely thing to, for you to say. I think it's, to me, what, one of my very favourite movies is a movie called The Umbrellas of Cherbourg, which um, Michel Legrand done the music from. And it's an unusual film because the whole film is sung. What, every conversation in it is sung and there'll be really mundane things like, would you like another cup of coffee? Or are you going to knock off work early today? And yeah. all things sung. And it's sort of about a quite unremarkable couple and their love story. And a lot of the things they're saying are not particularly clever or particularly incitive. Um, but the one thing, the love seems so profound because it's got this incredible music. You know, so you, you know, when they're saying they're things that aren't like the cleverest, smartest things, but they are quite mundane, everyday things. Their love feels incredibly important and beautiful because the music is so incredible so it's almost like we don't have the words they're not clever enough to say in words these profound things that they feel so the music does it for them yeah yeah and um that was definitely always a big a big kind of inspiration that that kind of notion of the music can say things a bit like the lighting in the film or an editing in the film can say things that the script alone won't say. Douglas, taking it sort of a bit further into the future in terms of, you know, the BMX banders are formed and you've got yourself um, some songs to play live. What were those early live gigs like for you? Did you find, a, you know, a fan base quite quickly or was it something you had to work locally quite hard at? What was the scene like? Do you know, it was, I'm not saying it was like really easy and it wasn't kind of overnight in a way, but, I remember what sort of happened was Francis McKee, who went on to be in the Vaseline's, was in a um, a drama group that I was in with some other friends. Uh, Norman went occasionally, Sean went occasionally. Um, Billy Boyd, who went on to be one of the Hobbits and lots of other things as well, yeah. he went to the group. We were all kind of friends. And I remember one time Francis McKee said to me, I'd love to be in a group. And I thought, I'm going to form a group <laughs> so Francis could be in it with me. And um, I knew I knew two people who I believe would be really great at being in that group with us, and that was um, Norman and Sean, and then our other friend, Hugh McLaughlin, he joined in as well. And I had the thing that I knew I could perform in front of people. I sometimes would find that um, I wouldn't be is easy for me to go into sort of parties and be the big success of a party or a social gathering. But when I was on stage, I knew I sort of had sort of chop, I had certain kind of chops that I'd probably honed from primary school yeah. that I could go on stage and people would watch me. And some people would be appalled, but <laughs> that's okay because it would they would they would react. And some people would really like it and some people would laugh. But I knew I could kind of, I could grab attention in that sort of way. I was kind of fearless, I guess, on stage. In fact, I was talking to Andrew from the band today about, I sort of feel more fearless when I'm on stage than when I'm walking around the supermarket or something or, <laughs> you know, just doing day-to-day -day stuff. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, uh, I guess like when Clark Kent turns into Superman, my transformation, the heightened Douglas appears on stage where he's, I, I, I get really nervous before shows, but when I'm on show and while I'm on stage, I feel generally kind of almost invincible. <laughs> it's not, a, it's funny as a persona, but it's, it's still very much me. It's just like a heightened yeah, yeah. version of me. A bit like, I guess, people always would say, like Tony Hancock, it appears in the Hancock's half-hour programs and things, is like a heightened version of, 
the the incidents that happened to him, the, the essence of that character came very much from what Tony Hancock was like. And um yeah, so I'm not I'm not trying to pretend that I'm some sort of rock, you know, mysterious wild rock star figure, but I'm not. I'm still being Douglas, but yeah, a sort of more a slightly more heightened version. Yeah. Douglas at two hundred percent. And all the kind of the gesturing they do and everything is is almost if you are you are telling the story and you're you're gesticulating in the way that you do and it's it is it brings such a different dynamic and a different element to to just what would be a you know potentially quite just a normal you know five guys on stage situation yeah i, I know well i guess see i don't have i don't have the advantage of or disadvantage depending on how you look at of having a guitar or something you kind of stand behind i remember you know I organised some sort of tribute nights with my friend David Scott to people like Serge Gainsbourg and Ennio Morricone and Brian Wilson. And I remember like Norman guesting at these. And he's such a great singer, you know. Norman can really sing and can sing pretty much anything and make it sound great. But he would go on stage and he didn't have a guitar. And he'd be like, I don't have a guitar. What am I going to do? <laughs> I don't have a guitar. I don't have a, a bass. I don't have a, a keyboard. I, you know what do you do and um it's a kind of strange thing but for me yeah i guess i i it's fortunate my five years of guitar lessons didn't really uh, <laughs> lead to me be, being a great player because I, I like the fact that i'm kind of unshackled i played guitar on one song one gig in 35 years of being mixed bandits and at the end of the song, I turned around feeling quite pleased with myself and everybody else in the band was laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. they weren't laughing with me. When it comes to sort of recording and, and releasing albums and things, um, you, you had a C, C86 and Star Wars with the 89 and 91 releases that you you, you, mm-hmm. uh, you did. And you just recently, obviously it's the 30 year anniversary of Star Wars and you've, you've uh, remastered that. Um, before we get to that, I was going to ask you about your creation days. I mean, this is a, a 90s podcast and I do yeah. tend to come away with that that era from uh, in terms of the, you know, the explosion of indie bands and and uh, your time yeah. on a massive label. <laughs> yeah, it's a strange one because I guess we joined creation a lot. I mean, they'd become pretty big because he'd released uh, Screamadelica um, Loveless and Bandwagon esque, all in the same year. Yeah, you know, so we'd become pretty big, but we joined them pre Oasis, so it wasn't. I hadn't become this kind of monster yet. Mm. And I have to say, my my experience on creation was really great. You know, um, Alan uh, loved the song Serious Drugs, which was actually recorded in 1991, but never ended up being released in 93 just because of we'd finished making this album Star Wars and we hadn't joined Creation yet, but he heard the track, finished, and said, I would like to release this. So we thought, well, that's where we'll go for our next record. But other people's careers were beginning to take off a bit as well, like Joe McClendon, his band uh, Superstar were beginning to happen. Norman wasn't around as much because of um, a teen, Teenage Fan Club. And then Eugene and Gordon started going, well, we're actually going to start doing this other thing as well. So the actual first creation album didn't appear till 1993 with Serious Drugs on it, an album called Life Goes On. And, I mean, Alan, I remember when we, we went into the studio to slightly retweak um, serious drugs, not do any new recording, but just to uh, we'd a little bit more of a, a budget to spend time just getting it sounding exactly as we wanted. Mm. He called everybody at work in creation into the office, stop what you're doing, come in, and he played them that track and was like, This is a really important band for creation records, and this is one of the most important tracks we've ever had. I want everybody totally behind this track. And, and he was like that the whole time we were there. He just, you know, we would play him tracks. And if he didn't, he was always very honest because if he didn't get it, 
at first he would go, I don't get it yet. He goes, but I totally trust you. And he goes, and I bet in two months from now or three months from now, or whatever, I'll think it's, I'll, I'll totally get it. Mm. And I think it's brilliant because I trust you. And that's why I wanted to join the label. And that was always, it was just great to have that, you know. He, he was so behind us. And me personally as well, he was incredibly supportive. He, he used to always go, you're going to end up, in a few years' time, you'll have your own TV show. <laughs> and it never, it never happened, but it was nice that he believed that it might happen. And then I remember we were about to go out and tour, and Alan phoned me up and was like, listen, I've got this new band, Oasis, and would you take them on tour with you? Uh, because I've asked some of the other bands on the label and none of them are that interested. And he's like, I can send you some stuff. And I was like, no, it's okay, Alan. <laughs> You've done an awful lot for us. If you want them to go out and tour with us, of course, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so we did a tour where we did, we didn't do the whole tour, but we done a number of the dates. And that was their first kind of, I think, experience of touring. Uh, and then after that, of course, everything changed yeah. in creation. And like Alan and Dick, just through his success, it couldn't remain what it was anymore. And it wasn't really a place anymore for weirdos and outsiders like BMX Bandits or people like Ivor Cutler or Momus. It became something else. Mm. And it couldn't go back to being what it was. And that's just how it was. And when we left creation, which was quite close to the end, it was in a really good way. It was like Alan and myself totally agreed. Yeah, this is the time to move on. It wasn't like, you know, we're, we're dropping you or anything like that. It was just like we had a discussion and we were both kind of going, this has been great. I'm really grateful for this and I always will be. But probably now it's time to to not be part of us anymore. Just going back to serious drugs, which is kind of where I heard you uh, first. Um, mm. it, you've, I've, I've seen you, I've heard you say this before on other sort of interviews you've done, but would you say that's the, the song that you would say encapsulates you and your band uh, the most? I think for a lot of other people, very much so. Mm. And I'm really grateful that and it's a song I think we pretty much would always do, unless we sort of had some sort of thing saying, you know, this is a special show where we're only doing songs from this thing for a particular reason. Yeah. Because I sort of think that is the song that's been kindest to me because, you know, it's, it's the one I've earned most money from. It's the song that most people know. It's the song where people really began to maybe think about the band in a different way. Um, there was always people that were massive fans before that, but it, it turned a lot of people's heads. They kind of went, oh, BMX fans, I thought they were a joke band. Wait a minute, this is a really good record. Mm -hmm. um, for me, probably the song that encapsulates the band most um, is a song that's on Star Wars, but actually the version that I, I would very much prefer is a song called The Sailor's Song. It's on the album My Chain. Mm -hmm. And it's a song, the kind of theme of it, it's like, you can heal me. And I always sort of say it's a song about the kind of healing properties of love and music. And it's very much a, a song that is meant to be a sort of about hope. It's got a kind of poignancy to it. And I think hope, it's a thing you were sort of saying earlier, it's one of the key things. Because even in a song like Serious Drugs, it's quite, it's a song about, uh, being sort of addicted to prescribed antidepressants. Mm. And I guess it's about, you know, someone not feeling very good regarding their mental health and a kind of breakup and all these things. But there's a lot of hope in, I think, the beauty in the, the, beauty in the music, the arrangement, yeah. the harmonies, and also the fact that it uses a little bit of humour because it's a quite funny thing the the idea of serious drugs that this girl sort of says to me one day you know oh you're on these tablets you don't need these tablets my love will make you feel better cut to a month or so later and she's saying i think you need some <laughs> i think you need some stronger tablets douglas um, 
<laughs> yeah. they, they have uh, the relationship pretty much ended. And I yeah. remember uh, thinking about it one night in my bed and I started singing it to myself like it was almost a little scene in a musical where I, I was imagining me and the girl having the conversations where it would be like, I said, I don't think I can take it much longer. She said, and then the girl's voice would appear in my head, maybe your tablet should be stronger, get some serious drugs. And I was kind of giggling, lying in my bed thinking about it, but I guess it's quite a funny scene. And then I can't remember what time, seven o'clock in the morning, maybe, maybe even earlier, I phoned up Norman and sang it down the phone to him and said, while well, you listen, think of chic mixed with George Harrison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, because I wanted Norman to kind of uh, help kind of put the chords to it and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And he, to he totally got it, you know. Um, and that later that day, um, about, I don't know, half nine in the morning, we left to go over to the studio and we recorded it. I mean, how many moments like that did you have I mean was it something that always came easy to you that that you know the melody and then I mean it's different it's lots of different things there's songs you know from like the creation era and before the creation era that um Norman would have pretty much came up with the musical idea and I would be the lyricist or Francis would do that but there would be other songs where I would come up with almost like half of a song and then Norman or Francis would come up with the musical bits that I didn't have, and sometimes some of the lyrical bits as well. Mm. And most of the time in the recent records, not all of the time, but most of the time in the recent records, probably um, I'm generally the person most responsible for the kind of musical and melodic ideas. There's occasional songs, but somebody just has this great melody and it ends up, you know, becoming a Beam Expanded song. And I would never want that not to be the case. And also some people come up with great melodies and they go, that is so good, but that's not a Beam Expanded song. That's a song for you to do your own thing with because I don't know what it is. It's just Beam Expanded, it's, it's a world. It's a sort of like, I guess, you know, you get TV shows like The Muppets or The Simpsons and everything has to sort of be true to that world. You can yeah. still be surprised by it. But, you know, if somebody started acting a certain way on something like the Muppet Show that seemed kind of really cruel and just there was no hope, no redemption possible there, you'd go, wait a minute, this is a Muppet Show or this <laughs> is Sesame Street. This doesn't, no, this doesn't work for that. So I guess for Beam Expanded, so sometimes hear songs and go, that's such a great song. And I'd love to have a go at it, but I know it's not really Beam Expanded. So with Star Wars then, the 30-year anniversary of, of mm -hmm. that record and the remastering of it um, and recent release, it released on the, uh, the 4th, wasn't it? Uh, May the 4th. Yeah, yeah, May and the 4th. May the 4th, May 4th with you. Um, so... <laughs> Um, that process, the remastering process, and what, what was that like? And and did you, how much did you uh, delve in it into that 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 process? If it, if we hadn't been in lockdown, I would have been at the mastering. But what happened was the I'd heard other work that the guy who was doing most of the mastering for uh, last night from Glasgow, the label involved, had done, and I thought, well, it sounds like. He knows what he's doing. He's got a good ear. And uh, sonically, I think he likes things to sound kind of like I like them to sound. Mm -hmm. um, kind of not muddy, quite bright. And again, full of full of love and life and a little bit of sunshine. And they just were really good at sending me stuff to approve. You know, and if I had notes, they were very open to all of that. But um, it was something that was done pretty quickly, not in a rush way, just because he got it, you know? Yeah. And also probably because Duncan Cameron, who recorded and produced the album, did such a great job initially. It also didn't, it's like, it's not one of those records that needed saved by the mastering. Oh, this sounds like a bit of a mess. The mix isn't very good. Can you do something in the mastering? Yeah, yeah. You know, 
Uh, so yeah, that was all good, and you know it was great. They were they were just really positive, and they came up with the idea for the sleeve, which is a really beautiful thing. Where originally the picture was on the front sleeve was, was of this horse, and it was hanging on my parents' wall uh, on their wallpaper, and now it's on a different wall because my both my parents are gone. And you know that house that that with that wallpaper won't have a wallpaper anymore because different people live there now. <laughs> but you pull out the inner sleeve, and it's back in its original wall again. So it's sort of like you know you get these scenes in movies where there's a kind of cross dissolve, and suddenly a bit like the Juliet Bravo theme for you, you find <laughs> yourself transported back. You know, I, I find myself being looking at this. The same picture, but on a different wall. Pull out the sleeve, and it's back in the old wall. And it's like I'm back in 1991. Yeah, yeah. When I made this record, when I was looking at this hanging on my parents' wall and thinking that could be a good sleeve. I'll stick a bit of paper underneath the picture, saying, and and you know, put on kind of Tippex Star Wars, and that'll be a good sleeve for the record. Yeah. Um, and it was them that suggested that. They they suggested. How about we do it as a sort of almost uh, thing where it's now, it's 30 years later, but inside it's still what it was in 1991. Well, that, that's the great thing about sort of, I guess, the, the marketing and production side of things or just the, the tactileness of re-releasing things is that you have got so much um, scope to just play with the medium like that and, and to yeah. make it such a, it is a great, I've seen uh seen a picture of it and, and it looks fantastic and it was the plan to do any any more remastering then of, of previous releases well it's been kind of fortunate because uh over lockdown our album c86 which was our first album was reissued by the label glass modern and um the album my chain which is my favorite of the bmx bandits albums uh, was it came out in vinyl for the first time ever which was yeah. a big thing for me. And I came out in a label called Interval, uh, which was a, just a new label that was the first release in it. And all of the labels done such beautiful jobs, none of them, because it sometimes happens that someone just somehow gets the rights or doesn't really get the rights to, but they do it anyway, to reissue something and you put no care into it whatsoever, you know, mm. and it just sounds shoddy. And I always think people are going to listen to this and think this is how we wanted it to be. Yeah. But all of these labels wanted them. They were all reissued by people that were real fans. And they wanted it to be as beautiful looking and sounding because they wanted to have a copy of it. You know, yeah. so they weren't just doing it to line their, their pockets. Which if to be honest, any any record label who are trying to do that with BMAC. BMX Bandish records are probably not making the right choice. <laughs> but, um, but we're going to do Life Goes On. Uh, the first creation album is uh, coming out next year on uh, Last Night from Glasgow. And we've got some plans to make that kind of special and beautiful as well. Thank you so much for joining me and talking to, you, to me about uh, BMX Bandits. Well, thanks. For, thank you for having me. And, Maybe we'll do it again someday. Well, this is the thing with the podcast is that um, I almost need to do two parts to some of these because the, the noughties was a big part of my musical sort of uh, influence. So I was sticking to uh, Ash, Rick McMurray from Ash, and I said, look, we've got to stick to the remit for the 90s, but can I have you back if I ever do a, a noughties podcast? <laughs> so I have to do the same no. with you. <laughs> you didn't even get any of the dirt on Oasis, but I'll leave that for another time. <laughs> I do part two of the dirt on Oasis. <laughs> oh dear! What have I said? Well, I'm sure. I'm sure it was a, a great experience for you to see about. Well, for them to to learn something. From oh you. yeah, we, they learned a lot. No, I mean it's it's funny because no one really knew um, what was going to happen for them in the future. But I guess Liam even playing in front of 50 people because they were they were on first. Yeah. So sometimes there would be 50 people watching them. Then the next band would come on who were kind of second on the bill and would be, you know, getting close to capacity, maybe about 70%. And yeah. you but like Liam was an extraordinary force of nature on stage back then. And 
Uh, you know, and I, uh, I think it was about the last time I saw him was maybe 10 or 12 years after that tour. We, we ended up meeting up in a TV studio, <laughs> <laughs> um, at which I was working behind the scenes. But we hung out a wee bit and he was in great form, you know, and he was so lovely and warm, you know, not just to me, but to the people I was working with. He was being really generous about how much uh, being an actor had meant to him and he's been really gracious and kind about it. And, you know, he's a nice, he's, he's a good guy. So that's my dirt, my dirt on Liam is he's a good guy. Well, I think you get the impression that it was all, um, it was all just very, blustery wasn't it with him he came in and the swagger and the and the, yeah. the showmanship a bit like anybody doing it and but but deep down there was there was nothing else really there and I think from from what he says now he's desperate to to go back to the original band and desperate for the yeah. to to make things up but the thing is with the podcast he's an actual performer yeah you know, yeah it's not it's like everybody's not going to be everybody's thing and nobody is at BMX bands aren't going to be everybody's thing we're going to be the less people's thing yeah. But he's undeniably a really charismatic guy on stage. He's got that. He's got that thing. I was going to ask you quickly because I just remembered actually. What what's it? What was it like for you knowing that? I guess or having that that some sort of kudos in a way that you're kind of the band's band, if that makes sense. Um, I know it's a strange one because I guess there's a lot of people who have been a lot more successful who have came through the ranks being mixed bandits. And then there's people like, you know, people who have much kind of wider distinction, who have said really generous things about the band. And I think it's because mostly people who have played in the band had a really good experience. And that sort of shows partly through the fact that but out of the last six shows we did, Norman Blake played guitar with us probably on three of them and he left the band in 1991. Yeah. You know, and he still pops up here and then because I think he thinks, well, oh, I'm free just now. It's better than sitting about watching telly. I'll go and have some fun with BMX Bandits. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think generally most people who have been in the band found it a pleasurable experience rather than an experience where they were like and i never want to see these people <laughs> again he also famously had the the kurt cobain quote the famous kurt cobain quote um yeah uh, that, yeah that kurt, kurt cool. said in a radio show in new york that if he could be in any other band it would be bmx bandits i always like to interject that i don't think that's him saying we were his favorite band his favorite band for me were undeniably the Vaseline's. I mean, he covered loads of her songs, and I remember how excited I, I was there. And Norman was there when Kurt first met Eugene and Francis, and seeing how excited he was by that. Um, but I think he really loved and admired Norman um, as a guy, and also the music he made. And the same with Eugene. Both of those guys had been in BMX Bandits. And I get the impression pretty much would always say, oh, being in BMX Bandits, that's so much fun because the pressure's not on you. The pressure's on the big guy, me being the big guy. <laughs> yeah. And you can just stand and play and have fun and a really good time. And, you know, you're playing good songs and with nice friends who are all into music. And I guess that, to me, Kurt didn't really like being in the public spotlight. Mm. and he loved music in its kind of purest form and performing music in its kind of purest form and he probably thought wow that's like a band it sounds like how it should be it should be fun and it shouldn't be turned into a kind of this monster where you know everybody's you know wanting a part of you and everybody's invading in your privacy and your troubles and all this sort of thing and putting you under a microscope mm. so yeah, it's kind of, it's a poignant thing almost to hear. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And I'm very, very grateful because it's definitely uh, given us quite a lot of positive attention from maybe people who wouldn't have listened to us before. And, you know, there's photographs of Kurt wearing a T-shirt. But he was a guy who loved music and he loved, he loved the pastels as well. He loved quite a lot of, you know, the music coming from, from Glasgow. But 
I have to say, Eugene Kelly, Francis McKee, The Vaseline's, The Vaseline's was um, Kurt Cobain's favourite band, but I'm, I'm glad he seemed to like us as well. Yeah, it's fantastic. Well, I will let you go now, Douglas. Cool. Uh, um, again, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. It's been fantastic. No, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Don't be a stranger. Thanks again to Douglas for joining me. It was an absolute pleasure. One of the kindest people in indie rock and uh, his his outlook and positivity and everything was just very infectious. It was such a fantastic interview and I had a great time. So ways you can support the podcast is the bit where you probably all switch off. Um, but those who are still with me, don't forget you can follow me on social media just to get all the updates and just about episodes and anything else that I fancy posting. And you can search for Back to Prit Pop on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. And then there's the review thing. If you fancy doing that, please do so. Uh, jump onto Apple Podcasts and rates. And if you've got time, leave a short review as well. That is super helpful. And if you want to buy me a virtual coffee, you can do that as well. And the link to the Ko-Fi or coffee link page, whatever, is in the show notes. You should find that. Okay, I'm going to have a little bit of a break. I'm going on my holidays. I'm being allowed out of the house, which is great. So probably no episode next week, but I should hopefully be back on track the week after. So thanks for listening as always. Take care. See you soon. (laughs) 